But today we speak about building communities of smart things and why it takes nerves. But first, if you want to follow with the slides, they're available at this URL. Because I know if we look at some code, it's difficult to read code on the screen from anywhere from the middle of the, of the room back. So if you want to follow with me, there they are. The URL will be on the other slides that follow. The Internet of Things. It will be amazing. You'll have your stove checking with your fridge and suggesting recipes from the cloud. Your toilet paper dispenser will direct mes message you when it's running out. Isn't that cool? There's even the idea of a smart bookmark that knows what page it's in in your book and stores it in the cloud so you never forget where you are in the book you're reading. Just amazing stuff. And how about a biosensing ring that will tweet your final farewell when you die? <laughs> oh, seriously. These are not the kind of stuff that are going to be transformative. The Internet of Things will be transfor transformative, but the one that really matters is the one that is the Internet of Things that removes inefficiencies, reduces risks, and it does that by automating, distributing, and integrating information far and wide. So we're talking about smart, not just smart cars, but smart traffic. We're talking about smart energy grids, smart houses, and on and on. And that means systems of systems. A smart car is already a system of systems. It has navigational locomotion systems. It has entertainment. It has energy management. It's a bunch of systems. And that car will integrate with the traffic system in order to optimize flow through a city, going around areas that are congested or where there's an accident and whatnot. So we're talking about systems of systems here. Uh, in the world of industrial processes, we'll see coordination amongst various um, tools in the, the manufacturing process. And these tools themselves are systems. And this whole process will also coordinate with supply chain systems in order to minimize downtime and maximize revenue. So we're talking about, again, complex systems of systems uh, benefiting from automation and, and distribution of information. But this is not the inf uh, Internet of Things that is being sold right now. There's a lot of companies, there's a lot of money being invested in the Internet of Things, but what we see on the market, or what I've seen, is a lot of companies fighting amongst themselves to establish their proprietary networking uh, technology as a standard. We're seeing the sensors to cloud. Basically, you have, for example, your Nest thermostat in your house, in all these houses, sending information to a central hub. And then the central hub will maybe do some big data analytics and then come back to you with a, a, a report uh, on, your, uh, on, on your iPhone, on, your, on, on the web or whatnot. And that, in my, in my, for my perspective, is not really interesting. This is not where the Internet of Things promises lie. I think the Internet of Things should be communities of smart things. And what I mean by a smart thing is it's an autonomous assembly of sensors and actuators that together make sense of their environment and act purposefully and in response to a changing environment. And now you, these smart things are going to be part of communities. And in these communities, they will coordinate. They will share information. I think it's smart things all the way down, personally. I think it's a fractal system of systems of systems. A smart thing 
with all its sensors, remember, a smart thing is an assembly of sensors and actuators, is itself a sensor because it makes sense of the environment. In that sense, it can report on what it has discovered, what it has made sense of to other smart things in its community or to other communities. A community as a whole can integrate all this meaning, all this information, all these perceptions from all the members of that make up that community and itself act as an integrated sensor to feed back into its members, providing global views, and also to other communities. So I think a community of smart things is itself a smart thing. So it's a fractal thing. Okay. Let's talk about autonomy. What do I mean by that? Well, I think there are five major components to an autonomous thing, a smart thing. There's sensing, so taking in sensory inputs, pretty obvious. Then there's perception, which is making sense of what's going on. If you think of a self-driving car, it's taking some pretty raw input uh, uh, beeps from uh, LIDAR and, 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 and radars, and, and then it has to translate that into, there's a motorcycle coming this way, and I think it's going to avoid me. It's fine. So making sense of all that input is perception. Motivation. If you're autonomous, you must have goals. You're trying to accomplish one or many things. And those goals are going to shift over time. You're going to have long-term goals, going to the hospital, and short-term goals, avoiding that pedestrian who's just launched in front of your car. Those goals shift. Then you have behaviors, plans. How am I going to achieve these goals? So you may have plans, long-term plans. How am I going to get from point A to point B? And then short-term goals, how am I going to you know, uh, negotiate this intersection? If we're talking about an autonomous uh, car. And finally, actuation, which is translating those intentions, moving forward, turning right, turning left, into actual physical action, which is moving the right wheel, and moving the, the left wheel, uh, putting on the brakes, and whatnot. So smart things are autonomous, but in order to be autonomous, they require cognition. Now let's talk about the cognitive architecture of a smart thing. That's something I presented last year, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat some of the, uh, the same material for most of you who, have not, who were not here, and then go beyond that. The, the cognitive architecture that I've been working on has been inspired by the work of Marvin's, Marvin Minsky in cognitive science. He wrote The Emotion Machine, and before that, The Society of Mind, which is the book that I read that first uh, made me uh, aware of this approach. And in a very, very, very big nutshell, Minsky's idea is that autonomous smart behavior emerges from the interactions of many kinds of agents doing simple things concurrently. Many kinds of agents doing things concurrently. Obviously, I think Alexa. I think the beam, right? So it was not a very big leap. Here's a, a diagram of this very simple cognitive architecture, which uh, I have implemented. Um, and let's just go through the, the, the big pieces of it and explain what they do very briefly. Let's start um, with the detector. Detectors pull sensors. They ask sensors for measurements. How dark is it? How far is the obstacle? Straightforward. There's an internal clock that just ticks. Time is fast. Time is fast. It's, in, it's quite surprising how critical that part is. But that, these, are, these are generators of percepts. Percepts are units of perception. Time has elapsed. It is kind of dark. There's an obstacle 14 centimeters away from me. These percepts, like every other units of cognition, feed into a central nervous system, and I mean that in a very limited sense, as a router. Feeds, and then is consumed by other components, other agents of this society of mind. 
one of the kind of agent is the perceptor. So you have all sorts of perceptors. And perceptors are just basically trying to take low-level low level percepts and produce higher-level percepts. So a, a perceptor that is responsible for detecting whether uh, we are getting closer to an obstacle will depend on percepts of distance and look in its memory, uh, are, is the latest distance percept smaller or greater than the current one? Am I getting closer? Am I getting further away? So you have perceptors. And perceptors produce percepts, like collision is imminent. And these percepts, again, sent in the central nervous systems, to go to the other agents, which we'll cover uh, soon, but feed back into other perceptors. Now, I may have a perceptor of danger that says, if I'm in an imminent collision and it's really dark out there, I'm afraid. I should be afraid. So a fear perceptor will generate a fear percept, which will be fed back again. Now, with all this perception, this layered perception being processed, all that concurrently, of course, these percepts are being fed to the central nervous system, and everything goes into memory, short-term memory, so we can use that and, and, and analyze what's going on in light of the recent past. Some of these, these percepts was also, will also hit something called the motivators, and the motivators basically analyze these percepts and say, should I care, and how should I care? There are motivators for fear, should I, should, I be afraid, should, should, should I feel panic right now? Should I, or uh, motivators for uh, hunger. Should I feel hungry right now? And these motivators basically generate motives, which again, are fed to the central nervous system, memorized in memory. And those motivators initiate behaviors. There are behaviors for what to do when you're hungry, what to do when you're curious, what to do when you're about to collide. And these behaviors are essentially little finite state machines that through each step produce intents. What, will, what should I do now? I want to go forward. I want to go backward. I want to turn left. I want to scream mommy. I want, I want to do something. Intents. These intents, again, fed to the central nervous system, memorized, but also consumed by actuators. And actuators are the agents that translate those intentions of acting into actual actions depending on the physical nature of your device. In this case, uh, if it's about moving an autonomous vehicle, moving forward, if I have a, a two-wheel drive, means turning both wheels at the same time. If I, um, I want to turn left, then I'm going to maybe uh, turn the right wheel faster than the left wheel. That's, these are actuators. So that's, that's basically the, um, the map of the cognitive architecture that was developed. And you can think of the activation of all these agents as creating all, a, a lot of OODA loops. Observe, orient, decide, and act. We have our um, detectors are the observers. Perceptors give you an orientation, what's going on. The behaviors act. I mean, the, the motivators decide what's important, what are my goals, and the behaviors act. Now, there's another piece that is new to, um, to this architecture, which is called attention. And attention essentially says, I'm not going to care about detection, detectors that don't matter right now. If, if I'm hungry and I'm foraging, um, then I need only certain senses to be alert. I will not pull all my detectors at all times. I will pull only my, the detectors that could possibly change what I am right now, what I feel, what I do. So that's kind of new. Um, and it's, it's actually uh, very useful when you have a very um, a, a small device that, where you cannot fire all your detectors all the time and just waste all these cycles. Okay. Now, meet uh, Marv and uh, Rodney. These are my two smart things.
they're Lego robots. They, um, they have all sorts of interesting sensors and uh, uh, actu actuators. First of all, they have LED lights, they have a speaker, uh, a wireless adapter, they have ultrasonic sensors for distance, infrared sensors to detect uh, um, infrared beams emitted by beacons. Um, I have a color and light sensor to detect the color on the floor and also the ambient light. Uh, I have a touch sensor that will, can be either pressed or released for collision, actual collision detection. And for actuations, I have uh, two large motors for a locomotion. And I have a medium motor, which I, I'm, I'm using as, as a mouth. So when the, the robot eats, it just activates that motor just symbolically. And there's going to be another actor here, their mom. Their mom is another smart thing, because we're going to be establishing two communities. You'll see, the kids and the parents. So that's the mom, and the mom, of course, is very smart, too. And essentially, it's a laptop running uh, Elixir on Linux. OK. The demo. So we have, as I said, two communities, the brood and the parents. I have two puppy rovers in the brood community, and I have a mom laptop in the parent community. And uh, let's see if we can get this thing going. So you'll see Marv and Rodney, Ro uh, Rodney roam around, bump into things, spread panic, look for food, and fight over it. That's their, that's their puppy behavior, and, and motivators and perceptors are going to drive this autonomous, these autonomous behaviors. Mom, the laptop, is going to keep an eye on them and just calm them down when they're panicking and, and, and you know, get them to share food. So let's see if we can get started. Okay. So they're going around. Oh, for some reason the sound's not there. So they're going around and, and bumping into things saying things like, uh, uh-ho, when they bump. And they're looking for food. And food is the white stuff on the, on the ground. Here they go. Say nom da nom da nom. So he's eating right now. And, and the other one is colliding and trying to get out of that jam. Nom da nom da nom. Now, now Marvin is hearing Romney eating, and, and, Rom, and, 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 Rod, and Marvin wants to go to that food. So uh, Marvin says, you know, mine, 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 it's mine. And Mommy, the sound is not good right now, but Mommy says, Rodney, share your food. And when Rodney hears, you know, I need to share my food, he starts, he stops eating. His hunger goes away, and he can move away and, and let, uh, let Marvin, you know, get access to the food. So now, and now they're panicking. They're panicking, and one started panicking, and the other started panicking because he heard the other one panicking. And mom, seeing that panic was out of control, intervenes and tells them to calm down. And they hear mom, and that's when it uh, stops. All right. Uh, do I kill this? All right. This. All right. And bring this up here. And all right. So we had two uh, autonomous smart things um, acting out with their mommy overseeing them and trying to uh, manage their behavior a little bit. So now we're talking about building communities of smart things. 
And in terms of tools to do that, I found that Elixir is a perfect fit for coding these many kinds of agents that do simple things concurrently. The NERVS project was critical because I had to fit a rather large amount of, of capabilities on a uh, small device, the EV3. And the NERVS project made that not only possible, but a, an actual pleasure. And this, this cognitive architecture is, is um, implemented as a framework, Elixir-based framework, NERVS enabled, that I call Marvin. And if you're familiar with the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you, you will know where that name came from. OK, and that's Marvin, actually. So in order to implement this, this uh, cognitive architecture, I made good use of Elixir processes. Every, every single agent is a, an invented process. I implemented using OTP and uh, relying very much on the Beam's soft real-time uh, characteristics. The smart things, as you saw, the, the, the two robots actually sense each other, perceive each other, and one knows when the other one is eating and gets all greedy, or when one panics, the other one starts panicking just by hearing the other one panicking. This was achieved through P2P networking with distributed Alexa. And the mom, watching them in it from another community, and we consider that a remote community, kept in touch, could, could hear what they were doing, could know what they're doing, because they were actually uh, uh, reporting through uh, a REST API, and she could talk back to them through a REST API as well. And that was implemented using Phoenix. Now, I'm not going to turn that into let's look at the code presentation because there's, there's too much, <laughs> and I don't think that's, that's uh, very productive. But if you uh, get access to the slides, you'll be able to uh, look at the, at the code a bit more closely. But I just want to make a few points. One, was that, one is that um, the data structures involved are very simple. They're very simple structs. For example, this is a, um, this is a, a struct for a percept. And it's, I, I need to know what is the percept about, can be darker, lighter, or whatnot. Uh, it's about light, it, the value of it could be uh, a, a number for the ambient uh, uh, light, or if it's, is it getting darker or lighter, it could be atoms. When was that percept uh, generated? Uh, since, un until when is it valid? Because you can have the same uh, measure being returned by a detector, we're at the same distance as we were five seconds ago. So you want to know, have we stayed at, let's say, 10 centimeters from an obstacle for the last five seconds? That could be important. Where did it come from, the source, time to live, how long it's going to stay in memory, and, and other uh, properties. But that's pretty straightforward. Now, remember this. This is for the color coding. How does that translate into uh, an Elixir application? So this, this is the observer. We're going to look at it si uh, in the right orientation. And I wanted to show you the whole thing. And uh, I want to show you where uh, the various parts of the cognitive architecture map onto uh, processes, supervised processes in Elixir. So what do we have here? We have uh, detectors, perceptors, motivators, behaviors, and actuators. They're all supervised agents, actual Elixir agents. Uh, the memory, attention, and the memory and attention uh, Components are actually supervised gen servers. The central nervous system is actually a uh, gen server wrapping a gen event with handlers for uh, perceptors, detectors, and whatnot. So this is in, in more and more details. You can see how it maps. So we had here, uh, you know, uh, percepts. They map here with with um, detector supervisor and and and, and what comes underneath and internal clock. We have uh, intents under behavior supervisor, all the various intents that uh, were activated on uh, the puppy rovers, and we'll see where these come from very shortly. Uh, we have attention here. We have uh, actuators and all the various actuators. Again, we'll see where that they come from that were uh, active on the puppy. Uh, motivators and, you know, greed. Uh, curiosity, fear, danger, and perception, the various perceptions that, uh, that the uh, puppies can generate. So this is all mapping onto uh, supervised gen servers and agents in Alexa. A 
an important point, all these cognitive agents communicate strictly through the central nervous system, through events. They're, they don't know of each other at all. So I can add more components to my architecture and I don't have a, you know, complications as to uh, too many, uh, any agent having to know too many others. There's no coupling, it's all through events. And let's look a little bit how a percept moves through the system very quickly. Let's say a detector detects that um, uh, ambient light is, is like say uh, 10%. It will be transmitted to the central nervous system, this, this percept, which will then dispatch it to perceptors, this perceptor handler or to the motivator's handler and other ones as well. But let's say let's go to the route of the perceptor's handler. The perceptor's handler looks at all the perceptors that are active in the system and says, who's interested in the fact that ambient light has a value? Oh, this one does. That's the one that uh, the perceptor for d detecting, for figuring out if things are getting lighter or darker. So it's, it goes to the perceptor, which analyzes the, the, um, this, this percept, and maybe comes to the conclusion that things are getting darker, generates a new percept, which is sent back through the perceptor handler and through the central nervous system and back into the system. So you can see this, all these percepts churning through the system, uh, turning on, turning off motivators, uh, initiating behaviors, uh, activating actuators, and then as the robot moves, it moves into a, a lighter area of the, of, the, of the room, a new percepts, and on and on. So that's the code, we're not gonna go through it, but that's a relatively small amount of code, and if we spend some time looking at it, it's quite declar declarative, it's quite straightforward. But we won't go through it. And a perceptor, the, the, the core of a perceptor is an analysis function that takes in a percept in the context of recent memories, and then does, uh, set, first of all, checks is, is the percept fresh enough? Because if it's an old percept, because my, 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 uh, my brain is, is falling behind because there's too much to process, then it will simply ignore it. Otherwise, it grabs all the memories that are, uh, that are uh, relevant and then calls the, log a logic uh, uh, the, the perceptor's logic, which is a function, passing the new percept and the recent memories, and maybe out of that comes out a new percept. That simple. Now, a smart thing's mind is what I call its profile. So a puppy has a profile, we have the puppy profile, we have the mummy profile. And they have different perceptors, different motivators, different behaviors and whatnot. The puppy profile, as we've seen, it cares about perceiving if things are getting lighter, darker, if we're colliding, if we're in danger, if we're hungry. Why are we hungry? We're hungry because we haven't eaten in a while and we've done some exercise. Um, is, is there food? Am I on top of food? Can I eat? Scent? Am I getting closer, further away from food? Uh, am I stuck? Is someone else eating and I want their food? Right? Is someone else eating? Motivation. There's curiosity. Hunger, greed, and fear. And important thing about motivation is that one motivation can inhibit another. If you're hungry, curiosity just like is inhibited. If you're greedy, then you, your hunger goes away because now you're not chasing food, you're chasing someone who's eating food. And if you're afraid, then everything else is irrelevant, you're panicking. So it's kind of a Maslow pyramid of needs kind of thing implemented here. And for behaviors, we have two kinds of behaviors in general. We have reflexes, which kick in at any time. You may be foraging, roaming around, tracking another, but if you're about to collide to something, reflexes kick in and you avoid the, the obstacle. And then you have motivated behaviors, which are more long-term. They're driven by motives. Um, he's, he's eating my food. I'm gonna try to find him and take it away from him. That's your motivated behavior. These are puppies, profiles. And the way they are, are relate uh, can be mapped out this way. 
You have all the perceptions and how perce one perception feeds into another, feeds into another, feeds into another, how they trigger motivations, how motivations inhibit motives, inhibit one another, and then how those motives trigger behaviors, and how those behaviors are expressed through uh, intents, intents to act. So let's, we can see a bit more detail, but I don't want to run out of time. So perceptions feed into motivation. Motivation feeds into behaviors, behaviors into actuation. So that's, that's the mind of a puppy. Mummy has a profile. It's a simpler profile, not because mummies are simpler, because I had less time. And their perception is, uh, here are, are my, my, my puppies panicking out of control? Is one puppy hugging all the food? And her motivation is, is, is only one, it's maternal instinct. Again, it's because I had little time. And her behaviors were very simple, either, either calming down panicking puppies or admonishing puppies to share their food. Okay? Now, so we've talked about a profile. Now, our smart thing also has a platform. Platform is the, 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 the smart thing's anatomy. It, a platform determines how do you talk to sensors, how do you talk to actuators. Um, the platform defines and implements rules of actuation. Again, if the, you, you may have two different uh, platforms trying to execute the same intent, which is moving forward, if you are a two-wheeled rover, turn both wheels in the same direction, the same rate. If you are BB-8, it's a different way of moving forward, but the intent is the same. So the platform translates what could be identical intents into very different modes of actuation. In, uh, in this demo, we have uh, three types. Uh, I showed there's two types of platforms, the rover, the puppies, and the hub, the mummy. I also have a muck rover, which allows me to, to uh, do testing with entirely on my laptop. Now, a platform runs on a system. The rover platform runs on a NERVS EV3 system. It could potentially run on another system, a Raspberry Pi, if I had the proper sensors and the proper actuators, the same profile could run, just plug in on another platform. The hub platform, which is the, the platform of the mummy, is any beam capable system. Now in order to talk to EV3 sensors and motors, the NERVS project uh, uh, supports the EV3 as a target system, uh, integrating uh, the, the good work done by ev3dev.org which, not to make a long story short, exposes all the sensors and actuators as read-writable files. Makes it very easy to interact with them. Um, and and NERVS project this is really, really fantastic. I mean, very little ceremony, super fast you know, firmware build and burn cycle. I mean, I, I cannot say enough good things about it. In, a sh in short, a smart thing is a platform on a system plus a profile. That should be clear. Um, then there's, uh, there could be some code where we can see how a profile is actually defined. And very briefly, uh, I have a list, the, 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 the a profile here, the, percep the perception part of a puppy profile is actually a list of perceptors, actually configurations for perceptors. And the important part, parts of a, of a perceptor configuration is what is the perceptor about? What does it, what, what the, comes in as input? Um, and what is the logic by which it will generate new percepts? And this logic here is actually a function. It's a function, multi-headed functions, multi-headed function here, let's say for light. And just go through this one very quickly. The first one says, if I have, you know, and a, 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 a person that comes in, I have no recent memory of anything. I can't tell if it's getting darker or, 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 or not. So I return nil, which is throw my hands up, don't know. If I get an ambient uh, percept and with some value, I look what the last ambient percept was in memory. If its darkness is greater, then it's getting lighter. If it 
was lighter, if it was darker, and it's getting, and then it's, the value is less, and it's getting lighter. That's it. I compare with recent memory. That's it. That's all it does. Very simple. Motivation, same idea. Motivator configs, one for curiosity, the other one for hunger. Again, same idea, a name, what it's inter interested in, and what's the logic for generating a, a motive. And here, the one for hunger is basically if I have a I am hungry percept that just came in, my stomach rumbled, and I have not been in any danger in the last five seconds, I could be motivated by hunger. If I get a I'm not hungry anymore, my stomach is full percept basically, then I turn off hunger as a motivator. Very simple. Again, lots of simple agents working together, interacting, and it's out of their interaction that comes out, that something interesting comes out. It's not, the parts are simple. The interactions are simple, but it's many of them, and they happen concurrently, and interesting thing, stuff happens because of that. Behavior, same idea. In this case here, these are, uh, each behavior is a final state, a finite state machine that says, what do we do? For example, panicking, when you start, you start panicking, which in this case would be turn the lights uh, red, uh, yelp, and then uh, go into uh, the state of panicking. And when you do that, do the panic behavior, which is just run around like a headless chicken. And then when you go from uh, danger to ended, when you finish panicking, then you simply do nothing. You're done. So it's very, very simple, again. Um, again, then the panic behavior is, as I said, turn on the lights and uh, go backward really fast, turn some random direction, some random amount, and that's it. Simple. And the actuation of, let's say, going uh, backwards, so uh, my, the platform uh, of a rover defines actuator, actuators and there's one for going forward, backward, turning right, turning left, and why not? And let's look at going forward, very simple. Again, a function, and it's a script that says which wheel to turn, which way, and underneath there's um, the, 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 the platform knows how to translate, go forward into the right, writing the, the right information in the right file so that the right actuator is activated the right way. So straightforward, again. Then I have, how this thing come to life, I have the smart thing supervisor, and what it does is for every detector configuration, for every perceptor configuration, for every motivator configuration, and so on, of the smart thing, it creates an agent. It creates a perceptor with that configuration, a detector with that per, uh, configuration, a motivator with that configuration, starts them, and the thing is alive. Now, let's talk about Community, communities of smart things. A community is created by name. Uh, a smart thing knows the name of its community. It knows at least one other peer that it can connect to. And as soon as it connects to it, it connects to the, the network and it can broadcast to the entire network. And every, any broadcast received becomes a heard percept, which then goes into the, uh, the whole process. It's done with uh, uh, P2, it's P2P with you, uh, done with the distributed Elixir using uh, PG2. We'll go to the code. It's, again, it's pretty straightforward. And that allows me to entangle two minds the way, the fact that they can communicate over that P2P network. And that's basically how they hear of each other. That feeds into a new percept. When they hear one panicking, it triggers their sense of danger individually. Um, and when they are, um, when they are, uh, when they sense another one is eating and they're not hungry, the greed motivator kicks in, and they start the tracking behavior, which means they're tracking the other guy, not the, not the food. They're tracking the other guy, and they can actually they can actually say things. So you can you can you can they can communicate through P two P to each other, so that one robot can say, "Oh, I'm eating," and then one says, "Aha." I want your food. That's uh, in a more blown up, but that's basically the idea. And again, uh, simple perceptions, what happens when, uh, this is the, the mummy's profile, how she will perceive 
out of control panicking, she will perceive food hogging, and she has behavior for calming down her brood, for uh, getting them to share their food. And just a, a little example here of a, a new rule that was added to the puppy profile that says, when I hear mommy saying, calm down, I turn off my fear motive. Straightforward. Now, connecting communities together, I consider um, uh, members of a community as being on a local network and communities being remote, and the communication is done through uh, REST uh, calls with uh, Phoenix doing uh, the work. And it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's just REST with Phoenix. It's pretty straightforward. This is how a, a percept crosses the boundaries of, of a community. Straightforward again. But the Internet of Things is not about puppy rovers and, 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 and mummies. Actually, I'll make the case that a, a, a self-driving robot has all the essential characteristics of a smart thing. It integrates multiple sensors and actuators. It must observe, orient, decide, and act autonomously. So I, I think having two puppy rovers interacting under you know, the eye of a mom touches many of the key aspects of communities of smart things. Still a demo. A little bit more about nerves. The brick is small. It's actually, uh, actually it's 64 uh, megs of RAM. Three, uh, uh, 400 megahertz uh, single core, very uh, it's small and it's kind of slow. This could not fit on an EV3 without nerves. Nerves really trims down Linux, and I, I, I have 15 megs of free RAM with this code and Linux on an EV3, which I think is pretty amazing. The process is amazingly fast. You can actually feel the burn. And you, uh, it takes actually less than 30 seconds to go from, to compile, build the firmware, burn it, and then just pick it up and plug it in. 30 seconds, so that's really good. So I think that Nerves and, 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 and Elixir gives uh, IoT coders, can give IoT coders really superpowers, amazing superpowers. I love the fact that uh, functional programming and pattern matching with Alexa gives me a declarative code. I love the fact that if I want a, a I want to go process crazy in my architecture, that's not a problem at all. Works just fine. And I love the fact that with nerves, I can fit Alexa and this architecture on smallish devices. So recapping, if we want to realize the big promises of the Internet of Things, we need to build communities of communities of smart things. Uh, a smart thing is autonomous, and autonomy calls for a functional cognitive architecture. And if you uh, have access to the slides, I'd encourage you to read this paper from a, a uh, Scandinavian uh, research institute about uh, architecture of autonomous vehicles, and that's the term they use, functional cognitive architecture. Marvin is a framework I'm building, we're building for for creating communities of smart things, and Lexer Phoenix Nerves make it an absolute joy to develop. I want to thank Frank Hunlith, who's been invaluable, and his help has been amazing in, in getting this done, and my intern, uh, William, <laughs> for actually building the robots. It's his robots. Thank you.